everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome to The Way on Father's Day and to all the fathers. We certainly want to say happy Father's Day to all of you caregivers and mentors, you who are literally standing in the gap. Happy Father's Day, certainly to my own father, uh, the great deacon, the Hall of Fame deacon, legendary James McBride. Happy Father's Day to you, Dad. Love you so much. And uh, thank you, as always, for the rich legacy uh, on which many of us stand, uh, particularly in our family, in our church, um, in our community. Uh, happy Father's Day. And so uh, if you haven't already, uh, just throw out a big Happy Father's Day in the chat. Uh, to all the fathers. If you have a father in your life uh, that you would like to celebrate, put their name in the chat and lift them up. And um, if you are uh, in an estranged relationship with your father, uh, we are certainly standing with you today and um, calling on the power of God's spirit to certainly comfort, but also perhaps even call us into a form and a season of reconciliation. And uh, that's kind of what we are going to talk a little bit about uh, today um, in our sermon and in our message. Um, what keeps you standing? Literally, on this Father's Day, I want to I wanna pose this not just to the fathers, but to all of us in this season. What keeps you standing? And um, I believe the Word of God is going to be a powerful, powerful lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So we're going to the text today. Second Corinthians chapter number six um, is going to be where we're going to come from. This is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, a church he has founded. It was one of his most um, earliest uh, successful church plant ministries um, in a very diverse city that uh, was known for its plurality, for all kinds of a different worship and religious practices. It was, a, it was a culturally rich space, but it also was a space where the ministry of Paul's preaching and teaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit literally took root. And it has become uh, both the first letter to the Corinthian church and the second letter to the Corinthian church, a wonderful resource for us to interrogate and to continue to reflect upon what does it mean for we who follow the ways of Jesus in a society that is, in many respects, anti-Christ, anti the ways of Jesus, of peace, of love, of joy, of reconciliation, of holiness, of right action, right belief, and certainly right relationship. What does it mean for us to hold dear to the truths of God's word in a time when that word is literally being blasphemed and twisted and turned uh, to be a tool and a weapon for the vulnerable or against the vulnerable. Well, the Apostle Paul um, is giving to us, I think, some uh, wonderful material that, as I said last week, we must not read through a fundamentalist lens, right? But we must take seriously to use uh, certainly the text that we have that is rich in its offerings, uh, the history of the traditions of our church that serve as an interpretive tool for us to rightly apply the words of Scripture, and then our experiences that continue to be the incarnatability of God's activity in the world, which means that God is always embodying us uh, through our obedience and our sacrifice to you fathers and mentors and and you men, God wants to embody you. God wants to be made flesh in the ways in which we show up in our families and in the world. Dare I say, what keeps you standing? And in a moment and in an age where we are still dealing with the aftermath uh, of the, uh, the Trump uh, regime politically and all the ugliness that it has uh, surfaced as we are still dealing with the uh, impacts of a uh, global pandemic that we are still limping through trying to get to the other side as we continue to have to live with the kind of racialized terror at uh, state violence and then the internalized trauma and pain and anger materialized through communal violence. As we continue to deal with fractured, broken relationships, we must ask ourselves and challenge ourselves, look ourselves in the mirror and ask ourselves, what keeps you standing? 
Come on, put that in the chat right now. Ask yourself, what keeps you standing? Well, the Apostle Paul, I think, may give you and I a couple of descriptions. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter number 6. We're going to read verses 4 through 13. This is the words of the Apostle Paul writing to his congregation in Corinth. Literally after he has already made a defense and a loving critique of their uh, gaps in faithfulness, they push back and, and accuse Paul of not perhaps being as faithful as he should. So he comes back. And he begins to give a little bit of his own testimony. And I think his testimony may help you and I be able to clarify our testimony. Verse number four, Paul says it like this. As servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Lord, have mercy. You got some weapons of righteousness. Lord, we're going to have to come back to that. Amen. Verse number eight, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, listen, we are treated as impostors, and yet we are true, as unknown, and yet are well known, as dying, and see, we are still alive. You ought to just put that in the chat as a quick testimony. After all we've been through, I'm still standing, I am still alive. Paul goes on, as punished and yet not killed as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. Verse 11, we have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, I speak as to children, open wide your hearts also. Oh, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us just say thanks be to God. Let us say thanks be to God. What keeps you standing? Come on, let's pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word that we have read. It is a word that we will hide in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And as I preach and teach your word this morning, as always, we ask for your anointing that makes preaching and teaching and even the hearing easy. Uh, hide me behind your cross. Touch my body and my spirit, my mouth, my heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. What keeps you standing? Now, it is obviously apparent that we have a, uh, a very difficult season that we as a people, as a country, as a community, as creation have been enduring and and um, you know I, I remember uh, the 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 writer in Psalms uh, I think it was David he said my foot almost slipped Whew. when I encountered the troubles and beheld the apparent uh, thriving of the wicked around me and 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 if you're honest sometimes we can indeed. Uh, find ourselves somewhat frustrated and paralyzed around the ways in which the onslaught of the enemy visits our lives and our persons and our unique calling, our identity. It is not certainly lost upon uh, me as I stand to preach that the month of June uh, is such a fascinating intersectional month where so many uh, folks transitions and and a penultimate and ultimate moments just seem to be colliding, right? And so it's often at the midpoint of the year an opportunity for us to reflect and think about where I've been, but where also I'm going, and what keeps me standing. Um, I believe that uh, part of what keeps us standing is the power of our relationships, one with another, certainly with ourselves and above all else with God, that serves as a foundation 
for what we must be able to build upon if we are going to be faithful to what and who God's called us to be, particularly in this season. And quiet as it's kept, relationships make the girl, the relationships make the world go round. Uh, healthy relationships with boundaries and spaces for ongoing healing and repair uh, cause us to have an inhale and exhale, if you will, of, of both rejuvenation and reflection that literally brings out the best in us. But it's also worth noting, right, that our relationships, when they are bruised and fractured, when they are strained, they cause us to feel a bit of uneasiness, so you lose your equilibrium. And it's a fascinating reality for many of us as we uh, um, celebrated Juneteenth yesterday and uh, we found ourselves celebrating Juneteenth uh, as a practice within the black tradition, the black uh, historical framework. Many of us uh, knew about Juneteenth. We, we studied or learned about Juneteenth. And for us, it was an opportunity for us to, to remember rightly that uh, there are times in our history where this country has always had to catch up to what we've always known about ourselves. I mean, I was doing a conversation with uh, some corporate folks and, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, teams this week in the Bay Area around Juneteenth. And I, I said to them, you know, the fascinating thing about Juneteenth is that um, we as black folks, as enslaved Africans, knew and understood inherently that we were free long before the Emancipation Proclamation. That there was something wicked and evil about uh, the way our relationship uh, in relation to this country or to uh, you know, uh, white slave owners were totally fractured and broken. And, and when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in, I think, 1863, um, it took two years, 1865, for this message to literally be delivered not to uh, the recently uh, freed uh, enslaved Africans in Texas and Galveston, but the message of uh, the um, freedom of the enslaved was to the oppressor, to the slave master, right? Which means that sometimes those who hold us in oppression, who profit from our oppression, first need to be challenged that your oppression is an object for the wickedness and evil to be made manifest in the world, and that which uh, comes to set us free right, is not just for those who are enslaved, but it is also to notify the oppressor that your time is up. And I want you to know, child of God, that for many of us, as we are enduring these seasons of difficulty in our relationships, whether they're with our children or our families, whether it's our relationship to the state and relationship to justice, or our relationship with our boss or even with ourselves, it's important for you and I to operate from the presumption that freedom is within our grasp, that we who are uh, filled and called by the Spirit, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? That means that we have liberty, we have freedom, and when messages of freedom are proclaimed to us, often that message is to remind you but also to declare to the enemy that would seek to oppress you or keep you in bondage. The enemies in your mind, in your heart, those enemies in our communities and in our social relationships, those enemies in the systems and the structures, those enemies in your past and even those enemies you've yet to encounter, the word of freedom comes as a declaration to them that you are free. And these kinds of declarations, I believe, are the, the substratum, the foundation of what keeps us standing. That we are a people who have always uh, uh, depended on the sustaining power of God, the consistent power of God's work to go before us and to pave the path and the way for reconciliation, right relationship. And I want you to know that reconciliation, right relationship must always be accompanied 
with justice, with repair, with uh, forgiveness, and with healing. And these are the practices that literally keep us standing. And so I want you and I to uh, think about for the next few moments, what keeps us standing in this moment where we are under continuous attack? Well, one of the first things that I believe the scripture uh, speaks to us right now about is you and I must be people who are willing to reject the myths, reject the myths. Come on, just say that I must reject the myths. Uh, verse number two says that we put no obstacles in anyone's way, right? Which means that there are moments in our journey where we will have to encounter certain kinds of obstacles that are often grounded in untruths. I mean, I've mentioned a little bit uh, the, the way in which Juneteenth has a little bit been skewed and folks think that the message was for the slaves, but I want you to know the message wasn't for the enslaved, it was for the oppressor and the slave master. And what I love about the way we must reject myths um, is that usually a myth or a false story it locks a part of the power that is inherent in us from being able to be fully expressed. A lie, a myth, a false, uh, a falsehood, if you will. It seeks to diminish the magnanimity of who we are. And you as a father, you as a uh, mentor, as a caregiver, as a life giver, how many of you know that we are often besieged by lies? We're besieged by stories about ourselves and our worth that often perpetuate harm that we must then work double time to overcome. I mean, when we think about the myths that, that are pervasive, particularly when it comes to this narrative around fathers being absent, I, I want to just push back and help us appreciate that there has been a systemic and a structural assault to literally keep fathers out of the homes of, of, of uh, their families. And there's, it's, it's well documented in the, in the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s that uh, when the social welfare policies were implemented, that uh, there was an incentive for men to not be in the home. And, 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 and there were ways in which families had to often decide if they were going to receive public assistance that uh, their, their partner, their husband, if you will, who may have been coming home from the war, who may have not been able to find gainful employment, or who may have had a criminal record, literally could not uh, be present when uh, the public welfare agents will come and check on the homes, right? And, and that this narrative that has been perpetuated, particularly around the ways in which fathers do not show up. I know that it can cause a, a deep pain and a strain on for and a strain for many men who are literally attempting to do their best in this season. But you must reject the myths that would try to uh, cause you to lose your responsibility to be present. Um, to be present in the life of your children, in the life of your community, to stand in the gap, to be as what we have said in some sermons before, cycle breakers, that we will not continue to perpetuate the kinds of harms that we have often uh, been victimized from. And I do believe that there is a deep moment and a space right now where truth must continue to uh, arrive in the face of falsehoods and help us reject some myths. Uh, there are myths out here right now around uh, the ways in which uh, issues of gun violence in our communities should be responded to. I mean, we were just uh, at the at the lake yesterday and we were selling all kind of things. My, my baby girl, uh, Nyla, launched her business in Joy uh, uh, reading and, and sold hundreds of dollars worth of bookmarks. I told her, you know, maybe I'm in the wrong business, praise God. You out here cleaning up the lake, amen, getting folk who don't even read to buy bookmarks. Somebody say, man, I'm talking about a marketing genius, right? Amen. But, but there was a tragic shooting towards the end of the day and I think one person was killed and several others are injured and all across the country we are attempting to reject the myth 
that violence and criminality are uh, inevitably adjoined to the life and the presence of black folks and brown folks in our communities and that the response to that violence should be more law enforcement and more criminalized uh, res responses to the anger, fear, pain, and trauma in our communities. And so rejecting that lie, rejecting that myth has material consequences, right? That there are stories that are being told about so many of us, uh, whether it's about our gender or our sexual orientation or our class, or our education or our nation of origin, lies that are told to us that seek to diminish the power of your inherent worth and gift. Child of God, if you are going to keep standing, you must learn how to reject these myths. How do you reject the myths that put obstacles in your way, that cause you needless pain and suffering and challenge? I want you to know that when Jesus comes, Jesus comes to clear the path. You ought to just right there in your home or in your room, just put your hands out and say, Jesus is trying to clear my path. He's trying to clear out the stories and the narratives about myself and about my family and about my unique calling that produce obstacles that keep me from moving forward. So this is the question for so many of us in this moment of us attempting to solidify ourselves and to stand firm in the calling of God, in the faithfulness of your role, in the unique uh, path that you are being asked to plow, what does it mean for you to reject the myths and the stories about yourself, about your family, about your unique calling that gets in the way of you being fully faithful? Lord, help me today. What does it mean for you to, to be honest about the ways these myths, these false narratives have put a mental block, an emotional block, a physical block, a material block in place that keeps you from being able to stand in the truth of God's word and the unique contribution you're supposed to make in the lives of those you love and in the lives of those who love you? I mean, if we're going to keep standing, we must learn to reject the myths. And then the second thing that you and I must be thoughtful about if we're going to keep standing is we must keep an open heart. Come on, just put that in the chat. I must keep my heart open. Paul says it like this. Our heart is wide open to you. And so in turn, open wide your hearts also. You will be surprised, child of God, how sometimes the task while you are standing, while you are, are, are pushing through the difficulty and the hardness of the season of grief and loss, of injustice, of transition, of pain, of illness, of sickness, sometimes our hearts can grow cold and hard and, and cynicism can literally seep into the soil of our hearts and rob us of the ability to have an open heart that welcomes the possibilities that are awaiting us as we go through the trials and certainly as we come out on the other side. I mean, it is so important for you and I to keep an open heart. Why? Because there will be moments where the myths that have been uh, spoken to you and about you will require you to reject the, the, the scarcity and the, the negativity that is described and with the open heart embrace the possibility. I just want to go back uh, to, to verse, number, uh, 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 verse number eight where it says that we are treated as imposters and yet we are true as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see we are still alive, as punished and yet not killed. That there are moments in your journey where keeping an open heart allows you, in spite of the reality of your struggle, to be open to the possibilities of the truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sometimes the truth is what actually keeps your heart open uh, when you are rejecting the lies that are often attempting to invade your reality through your struggle. I want you to know that avoiding the cynicism and the hard-heartedness that can come 
from your struggle is so critical. And this is part and parcel of what so many of us as men and as uh, 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 traumatized individuals must continue to acknowledge that hurting people hurt other people. And when we get hurt, often our heart, it retracts rather than it opens. I mean, part of the trauma and the pain that is caused by, let's say, patriarchy or violence or the hierarchies is that they create such harmed and traumatized individuals that we then often revisit that trauma onto others. Uh, I, 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 I was speaking again in a, in a, in a, uh, a, a conference talking to those about uh, what makes uh, the young men in our community so vulnerable to violence. And I said, well, it really depends on what season you enter their life. Because if you enter the life of an adult man, not experiencing them as a victim, but as a perpetrator, you may skip the opportunity in their life or the season of their life when they were actually the victim. That many of us, we only encounter so many folks in the moment of their pain and not in the space where the pain was caused. I mean, I know so many young men and, and older men who, who are violent as a result of the violence visited upon them. That the anger, the fear, the abuse, and the trauma, and the pain uh, once visited upon them, they are rarely treated as the victim. And so some of the work that we have to do as men is be committed to the healing work, the work of healing from our pain, the work of healing from our trauma. And if there is one indictment, and you know I have many, on the way in which our society uh, 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 responds to the trauma, the pain of our community, it is that we don't provide spaces for healing for men and for boys in our culture. Uh, I, I was I was speaking with uh, Dr. Noha over at the Roots uh, uh, Clinic in East Oakland, and we're doing some work together on uh, COVID and vaccines and uh, public health responses to gun violence. And she had mentioned to me that we are literally dealing with uh, a global pandemic, and there are so few resources for mental health and healing particularly for black men, for men who find themselves living in the margins of both unemployment and poverty, or even those who find themselves with benefits but can't access the right kinds of services. I've been trying to access uh, mental health support for myself and for uh, members of our family, and it's been so difficult, even with my own insurance, to be able to find skilled and culturally competent mental health providers. And you know our church, we have a huge network of mental health providers, and, and it's such a fascinating but disheartening reality that the largest provider of mental health services for men in this country, black men in particular, are jails and prisons. Think about that. That jails and prisons are usually some of the first places where men, black men, have their first uh, opportunity to be prescribed their medicines if they're schizophrenic or bipolar or disassociative in their uh, 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 reality. They, they are usually uh, uh, not able to have access to mental health services unless they are first criminalized. And so when you and I, particularly as men, are attempting to stand firm against the onslaught of trauma, we must be able and committed to healing and being healed in our own lives. That there is an obligation that you and I have that in our families, our relationships with our children, our relationships with our partners, our relationships with those who God has placed in our lives, that we must keep an open heart. Why? Because the heart of God, the heart of God's servants are always open to us. And so one of the things that I hope you and I can take away from this very difficult season of transition, whether it's COVID or gun violence, whether it's uh, the political or justice transitions, keep an open heart. Be responsible for not only healing yourself, but facilitating the killing of others. We must scale up healing in this country. We must scale up 
health uh, responses to social problems in this country. We must in the church be able to help people be comfortable with the reality that life can be hard, but guess what? God is still good. Woo! I've had to tell myself that so many times in these past few years. Life may be hard, but God is still good. And the relationships of, 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 of healing and mutuality and, and presence and consistency are often the key to keeping us standing. And then the final thing that I'll just lift up, child of God, if you are going to keep standing, you must be able to endure. Oh, come on, somebody just put in the chat, I will endure. I won't give up. I won't throw in the towel. But verse 4 says, I am able to keep standing through great endurance. Oh, my goodness. How many of you know that it is indeed the case that it will only be because of your, as my pastor used to say, stick to itiveness, your ability to stick to it and to not throw in the towel that even when it gets hard and even when it gets difficult, I will endure. And how I endure will be a reflection of the power of God's spirit at work in me. It will be a reflection of the ways in which I am actively pursuing healing and, and, and being healed and, and the ways in which I am facilitating healing for others. That my endurance, my ability to keep showing up even in hard times, even when the myths are bombarding me, the truths are coming uh, my way as well, helping me to be back the lies and the narratives that seek to cause me to throw in the towel. I mean, the Apostle Paul, he tells them in great detail, listen, it is through great endurance that I continue to show up, that I continue to offer as a co-worker, a co-producer of God's grace and power in the world. As you show up as a father and as a, a, a partner, a husband, as a mentor, as a caregiver, you must endure. What does Paul describe his endurance? And when I started to read these, boy, I, I said, man, get your hands out my pocket. Man, I was like, you all up in, in my business. But it says, in afflictions, hardships, and calamities. Think about the, the ways in which you have been afflicted and the ways in which you have had to struggle through hardships, the, the tragedies that besieged you without any warning, you must endure. He goes on to say, in beatings and imprisonments, in riots and labors. Think about all the many ways the criminality and the criminalization of black men and of men of color and, and, and those in our communities who are most vulnerable results in them serving time in jails and prisons. We have men on death row that have been there for decades only to find DNA uh, literally setting them free. Uh, think about all the ways in which you have to keep enduring through the, the false uh, 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 criminalizations and the false claims of the systems that seek to take your freedom away, you must keep enduring. He goes on to say, sleepless nights, hunger, Lord have mercy, when your check is delayed. Somebody say amen, right? Uh, truthful speech and, 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 and by purity and knowledge, you must endure. How do you keep standing? By purity, by knowledge, by patience, by kindness, by holiness of spirit, by genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God. Who Paul is giving you the keys to standing that you must stay gentle and you must stay pure and you must be one who exudes genuine love. These are the things that keep you standing. And then he talks about that we have through the power of God weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Lord, I must tell you, child of God, that some of us right now are, are finding ourselves uh, wavering because we've let our weapons of righteousness down. We placed them down and we picked up some weapons of unrighteousness. Can I talk to you real talk for a few moments? Amen. That even right now, as we continue to push forward and push through in this season, you must keep the weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds that God has given you weapons to fight the enemy that comes against you. All of these enemies that I've mentioned, God still gives you weapons in your left hand, a weapon of prayer in your right hand, a weapon Weapon of praise. Somebody say, I got my weapons. Amen. In your left hand, 
God's giving you a, a tool of thanksgiving and in your right hand, God's giving you a tool of, of a good memory and a testimony. Somebody say, I've got my weapons. In your left hand, God is giving you a tool of forgiveness. And in your right hand, God is giving you a tool of reconciliation. Somebody said, I've got my weapons. In your left hand, God is giving you a tool of truth. In your right hand, God is giving you a tool of confidence and faith. I have my weapons. And when you have these weapons, you can endure to the point that even as the scripture says, I may be poor, I can still make many rich. I may have nothing, but I can still possess everything. Why? Because I know that I can endure these trials and I can keep standing. I want you to know that part of our task in this season on this day when we celebrate fathers and, 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 and dads and caregivers and mentors and folks who stood in the gap, all of us must begin to keep telling ourselves, God has given me what I need to keep standing. And child of God, if you can keep standing, if you can keep uh, holding firm in the freedom and the liberty where, where God has set you free, you create space for God to come and not just cause you to keep standing, but God will cause you to take steps forward. One step forward towards your destiny. One step forward towards your victory. One step forward towards your deliverance. One step forward toward everything God has given for you to accomplish. Keep standing. Keep believing. Keep trusting that victory is ahead of you, child of God. All you have to do is just catch up to it and you can stand. Come on, let's take a few moments. Let's just invite the spirit of the Lord to give to us a, a refreshing of the strength needed to stand. As we transition out of this season of change and as we continue to endure the challenges of COVID, as we continue to endure the challenges of of intergenerational trauma and pain and anger and fear and death. God, our prayer is that we can keep standing, but not through our own strength. But as you have declared in this text, we can stand in purity and faith and genuine love. God, we can stand in kindness. We can stand in the ways in which we facilitate our own healing and the healing of others. God, I pray that you will help us to stand. And on this day, Lord, as we attempt to remind ourselves of the ways in which we are called to be fathers and dads and folks who, as Isaiah 50 uh, six says, are able to stand in the gap and be repairers of the breach. I pray, Lord, that we will turn to you, the ultimate repairer of the breach. You who has saved us, you who has delivered us, you who have paved the way for us to walk in truth and power and strength. God, we give our lives again to you. We renew, we recommit. We ask you, Lord, help us to be faithful in this season. We confess with our mouth, Lord God, and we believe in our heart that you are the Lord and the Savior of the world. We, Lord, ask for your forgiveness for the ways in which we've fallen short. We ask you to forge a path of both reconciliation and healing in the lives and the relationships that have been broken and fractured and harmed. We ask you, Lord, to help us to do and to be Lord God, men of honor and men of faithfulness, people, Lord, who can reflect your goodness and your mercy and your love and your joy. So on this day, God, what keeps us standing, it's you. And so it is to you that we give the glory. It is to you that we give the praise. Be our strength like no other. And we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Keep standing. God bless you. Happy.